In this video, we're going to take a look at how the Artex Space Spider can be used to take full-color 3D scan data of a small part like this one. Small meaning roughly the size of a human head or smaller. For larger objects, the Artex Evo would be more appropriate. Spider has a resolution of about 50 micron, the Evo 100 micron. So as we go to scan the part, the way that this works is the space spider has some LED bulbs that are going to project structured light, a grid of structured light onto the object. And then digital cameras are going to look at the curvature on those grid lines and use that to infer geometry. One of the cameras is actually going to pick up textures, which is a scanning term basically just meaning colors. So that at the end of the process, we can make a photorealistic rendering of our part. Now, as we're scanning, any optical scanning method, either projected light or lasers, is going to struggle with any kind of a shiny or a reflective surface, uh, clear surfaces, things like that. So if that happens, if we have a part like that, we can either bump up sensitivity settings and go through a little bit more post-processing, or if you don't care about realistic colors, you can spray it with a powder spray like this spot check, or even foot powder that you buy at CVS works very well too. You just want to take the shine and the gloss off the surface of the part so that the cameras can pick up the grid. When I go to scan, I'm going to start out in our tech studio by simply pushing the start button on my scanner. That's going to bring me into scan mode and on the screen I'm going to get some visual feedback of what the scanner is seeing. I'm also going to get a histogram on the left side of the screen showing me the distances between the scanner and the object surfaces. I want to keep the peak of this histogram right about in the middle of the range between 170 and 300 millimeters. The EVA has a much bigger standoff, more like two and a half feet. When I'm ready, I'm going to hit the up button again on my scanner to start recording. I'm going to start moving both the scanner and the part around. I like to use a simple turntable, this is literally just a lazy Susan out of my kitchen, to help me maintain a constant distance to the object. Now if we take a look at this scan data, what we'll see is that we've got a series of frames as I was moving around. Scrolling through these I almost get kind of an animation of that scan that I just took. Our tech studio, our software, is going through a process as I scan called rough registration. Registration means taking each frame of the scan and fitting it into the other frames in 3D space, moving them around so that they line up in this 3D space. Later on in the process, I'm going to do a higher resolution version of that registration two more times. Now, I want to get full coverage of this object. I want to get the entirety of it. So I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to scan the other side. Go into preview mode again and find my distance and then I'm going to start recording the same way. Space Spider has a frame rate of 8 frames per second so I can go pretty fast here. I should note that we do have, uh, we do use both geometry and the textures on the part to perform that process of registration, which is why I've drawn grid lines onto my turntable. That makes it a little bit easier to grab onto. Objects that have less geometric distinction, like a plain cylinder or a flat wall, can be difficult to scan because there's nothing for the software to grab onto for registration. For objects like that, we can actually get better scan data by adding some markings to the thing that we're scanning, either maybe some masking tape or using a Sharpie to draw some lines on it, gives that registration algorithm something to grab onto. Now, this scan data looks great, but before I put the two scans together, I've got some extra data that I want to take out, all the ground plane from my turntable. So I'm going to jump over to the editor tools. And notice on the screen that as soon as I click off the scan window, Artex Studio is going to automatically go through fine registration. 
That's the middle of the three steps of fitting these scans together, this time at a little bit higher resolution. Now I'm going to take these scans one at a time and use my eraser tools to get rid of the data that represents the base. Now I can use a paintbrush to kind of highlight areas to erase. I've got other things like lassos and rectangle selects that work really nicely. But our Tech Studio has a really powerful base selection tool that's going to intelligently go through and highlight for me what it thinks is the ground plane of my part, what I usually don't want. And in this case, it does a great job of selecting exactly what I want to take out with a minimum of effort from me. Next, I have to make these two scans line up in three-dimensional space. So I'm going to go to my Align tool. Now, alignment can be done automatically by the software, and it usually works pretty well. But in this case, I'm going to show you the manual mode. I'm going to pick a couple of points on the two scans that represent the same area of the part. These don't have to be perfect, but it's going to help the software pull the two scans into roughly the right alignment. And then, when I hit the Align tool, it's going to use all of the texture and geometry in the part to get the best possible alignment between these two scans. And if I change the colors on the scans, you can tell pretty well when I rotate and look at the point cloud data that these two match up pretty darn well. That looks great. So I'm going to jump to my next step in the process, global registration. This is the third and final highest resolution step of pulling all the different frames of these two scans into the most accurate alignment possible. Next, I have the option of running an outlier removal algorithm. Outlier removal is going to try and take out some of the noise. And it should be noted that the Space Spider with a 50 micron resolution is powerful enough to take out, to, to grab data from things like dust particles in the air. So some of the little flecks of material in here are actual data that's been corrected, collected. I'm going to avoid uh, or skip this step for right now. My scan data looks pretty clean. And I'm going to jump to the next step of running a fusion. Fusion is going to take all this data from the two scans and pull it into a single object of tessellated geometry. I've got three options. Fast fusion is my most accurate because it's going to do the least correction on the part. It's only going to grab and use data to make surfaces that are really there. Smooth fusion is good for organic objects, like if I was going to scan a person's face. Smooth Fusion is going to take little inaccuracies in the scan where maybe the person's face had moved because they were breathing while I scanned, and it's going to smooth over some of those rough areas where the scan data didn't perfectly match up. Sharp Fusion is great for mechanical parts like this one. Sharp Fusion is going to do a little bit of hole filling. It's also going to work out some inconsistencies in the sharp edges and try to clean up a little bit. We'll go ahead and see how this comes out. And because we are pouring through a fairly large pile of data, these fusion algorithms can take a little bit of time to run. This one in particular should take between 30 seconds and a minute, but for larger data sets, this might be a time when I would go you know, fill up my coffee or uh, let this run while I go to lunch. It all depends on the power of your computer and how much data you're asking to be processed. All right, that took about 45 seconds, and I've got a pretty nice looking result. A lot of detail in this scan, along with a few missing areas inside surfaces. It's going to be hard to get the right angle with my hand so that I pick them up. I kind of did better on one side than the other, it seems. I do have some cleanup that I can do in our tech studio afterwards. Uh, this part has kind of an orange peel surface, so I've got uh, a bit of lumpiness on here that I might not want, depending on what I'm going to use this scan data for. So I can run a smoothing algorithm to try to take some of that off. I can also run mesh simplification algorithms. What this is going to do is going to shrink down the overall size of the file so that it's easier to work with later on in my post-processing. Right now, 
This is about 45 megabits of data. And the mesh simplification is going to take out some of that complexity. After this is done, I can also run some cleanup tools locally, whereas so far we've only seen the global tools. All right, that's done. That brought us down to about 15 megabytes. I can go back. I can use uh, my hole filling algorithm to try and close up some of those holes. If I need a watertight STL file, say for 3D printing. Now this hole filling algorithm in Artec Studio is not especially powerful. It's really going to just take the shortest distance through the hole and, uh, between the surfaces and try to fill the hole with more or less a saran wrap algorithm. Now this can be good or bad depending on what your application is. But if I want to 3D print this, I do need a watertight solid. For other applications, I might leave the holes in there because they're not a problem. I can run local smoothing tools, like the smoothing brush, to kind of take it a little area that's got too much lumpiness on it and smooth that out. I could also use the defeature brush to try to take out features like this text on the part. That looks pretty good. Now the last thing I'll do is apply the textures to this part so that I can get a good photorealistic rendering. I'll simply select the two scans that I want to use and apply. Now this is another step that can take a little bit of time for my computer to crunch through all the data. You should also note that for applications where you want a really, really good photorealistic rendering, it's advisable to set up good quality, even studio lighting, which I don't have here in my office. I'm working with, you know, standard overhead fluorescent light bulbs. So here I might see a little bit of inconsistency in the colors due to the fact that the lighting on the part changed when I flipped it over from one side to the other. This looks pretty good compared to what I have sitting on my desk. And I can also shift the brightness or contrast a little bit using slider bars on the screen. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have any further questions, please reach out to your local TriMec representative. Thank you very much.